Oh, hey, Alice is here. Hey, Alice. Hey, Alice. How's it going? Uh, you walked in at a good time. Tonight, we got Tonya and Cody from uh, Lydia's Castle. How you guys doing tonight? Doing good, man. Thanks good. for having us. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you guys. You guys just released a new single, Phoenix, uh, available everywhere. Congratulations on that. Uh, it's a great song. I've listened to it several times. Uh, looking forward to uh, in anticipation of this. So, yeah. Thanks, yeah. For, thanks, thanks for checking it out. Yeah. 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 We, don't, we don't hear a lot of uh, these days, I don't hear a lot of uh, local and even newer bands doing anything that's even that heavy you know and not not y'all are very very heavy but y'all got a y'all got a power sound there's a lot real, of punch to real, it real power behind y'all i'm glad to see that still happening especially on a local level yeah yeah there was a um, you know there's definitely a lot of great bands um around nashville in and around nashville and uh you know, I don't think that we're necessarily the most original, but I do think that we uh, do our best as far as bringing that sound. And, uh, you know, we, we try to fill some sort of void in the scene, whether whatever that may be. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We uh, there's just, there's a lot of great bands in Nashville, so it's hard to compete. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah there's a lot of talent here for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Where are you guys from? I'm originally from uh, North Carolina and I'm from St. Louis. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. I feel like nobody's really from uh, Nashville nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Most of us not. I think, uh, I think they're called what, like unicorns. Is that what the, the terminology <laughs> is? Like if you're from here and born here, grew up here, still living here, you're considered a unicorn. He, he's a unicorn. Actually, no, um, no, I, no, I wasn't born here. Oh, that's right. You've just no, been here I've forever. Just, I've been here most of my life. Oh. And that actually amazes people because I talked to people for a little bit and they're like, you've got to be from here. No. <laughs> and it's true. There's, I have a handful of my friends that were born here, but most of them uh, moved away or even the, some of my oldest friends that were here as long as me, you know, moved here when they were young. So. I grew up about an hour and a half south of here. And we would come up here to do things like on the weekends occasionally, but like I, I wasn't up here until I was about 18. Oh, okay. Are you guys musicians as well? Uh, he is. I okay. am not. I'm a poet. Um, Very cool. I, yeah. I do, uh, I, yeah, I do um, prose and uh, short stories on Instagram. That's really cool. Thank you. And what, what do you play? Um most uh most anything with strings on it okay i uh play woodwind um i've been learning i play like i like to say i play synthesizer you know <laughs> not keyboard <laughs> i can't I'm not, I'm not really a piano player but i do a lot of work on synthesizers and uh but these days i've been doing so much production work it's i play what needs to be played i try to get other people to come in and play so it's not me on everything, you know? Yeah. So you're really good at making noises. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah you, Don't you, worry, Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to pretend I'm a piano player, but I, I can't play it. I, I can't even play the synthesizer. Uh, that, that's a whole unique art form in, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just production in general, you have to have a really uh, fine-tuned ear for that type of thing, mm -hmm. um, you know? That's because that's an all around thing. That could be strings, that could be yeah. pads, that could be, uh, it could be anything. I mean, it could be additional drums. It could be whatever, whatever the case, whatever the, the song needs. So that's, that's kind of a wider palette of talent than probably most other instruments. So that's, that's <laughs> definitely very respectful for yeah. sure. Oh, for sure. Like sometimes I'll come over here and he'll be in the middle of building a beat for something. And then other times it's just like other people have projects that he's, making uh realistic you know yeah yeah that's cool. yeah you keep busy for sure <laughs> yeah well, anytime you don't get busy you want to hop on stage with us just <laughs> yeah, <you're on> <laughs> just come on up <laughs> yeah. I, I love playing i love playing that's you know why i do what i do sure <laughs> yeah. what do you guys um you know coming up from um your different backgrounds what kind of music did y'all really you know each each of y'all what really 
sparked you? What was, you know, like your first, the first thing you heard that you can remember as a child that made you go, wow, what is this? What is this sound that isn't just blabbing at me? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, you want me to go first? Sure, you can go first. Okay, so. Uh, I already know your answer. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, so I grew up with my dad mostly and also with my mom as well. Um, but my dad used to listen to a lot of um, 80s hair metal. So that's a lot of, of what I grew what I grew up with. So, you know, Bon Jovi, uh, Guns N' Roses, that type, of, that type of deal. Anybody you can think of. Even some of the bands that you probably had never heard of. Obscure 80s bands is kind of my dad's specialty. So, uh, but um, as far as what I guess definitely perked my ear, um, as far as, hey, maybe this is something I could do. Um, probably obvious answers would be Hendrix. You know, that was, like, he's, he's the man in my book. Um, also, Randy Rhodes. I mm -hmm. think that was, a, that was a big influence on me as well. Um, you know, hearing Crazy Train, that was, that was one of the first songs I tried to learn. And obviously, that's not a beginner song. But um, oh, no. But... <laughs> That, that was probably my first uh, my first memory at least of uh, of being interested in trying to learn how to how to do this what we do now mm -hmm. sure what about you yeah. um I would say uh, I grew up actually on country music so I did not grow up on rock and roll um, I started writing lyrics and singing uh, Martina McBride from a very young early age um, I, in fact, like grew up wanting to do country music until uh, I heard Lizzie Hale's first or the Hailstorm's first uh, record back in 2013. And I was like, wait, I want to do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then ever since then, um, I've just done rock and roll since 2013, never really looked back. But, you know, the country aspect was really great for writing, um, you know, the storytelling and really being able to get your message across. So I think for me, um, music wise, like the turning curves was just um Martina McBride and Lizzie Hale. That was really two big pivotal points in, in my vocal career. Nice. <laughs> how did, um, if you don't mind me asking, how do you guys, how'd you guys meet? Was it over music? Yeah, so uh, we had our own separate bands in St. Louis and, um, you know, he had his band, I had my band. We battled each other in Battle of the Bands, and we. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it was a little Taylor, more than, but um, the Taylor's way we. Oldest time. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. What was that? I was just saying it's Tale as old as time. It's like Lady <laughs> and Tramp. It's like yeah, we were dueling bands. That's a great yeah. story. Yeah, it, yeah, and and more of a sense of that too. We also, uh, you know, we collaborated a little bit as well at the very beginning. Um, when she first moved to town, my old guitar player was was looking to uh, produce, you know, and you know, up and coming artists around the St. Louis area, and uh, she answered the call, and uh, he invited her to one of our uh, rehearsals to because we were throwing a, a big Halloween show in St. Louis at, at that time. And um, we were doing, uh, have you, you guys watched that uh, movie, The Lost Boys? I'm very familiar with The Lost Boys. That's from my era. I don't yeah. think I have. Mm -hmm. Well, watch it. One, it's one, of the, <laughs> one of the greatest movies ever, but um, one, one of the most classic movies, uh, you know, uh, good is, is subjective, I guess, to, to your taste, but <laughs> um, I, uh, there's a song in there called Cry Little Sister, and we covered that song, and we needed a female part to do um, the, the background vocals, and that's, that's where she came in, and that's where we met, was at one of my rehearsals, and, um, you know, after that, she continued to do her own thing, um, and that's just how we met, was just, you know, playing shows in and around the St. Louis scene, and, um, yeah, that's that's how it. I gotta say that nice. that's uh, it's pretty impressive that y'all did cry, little sister. Alice, if you're not familiar with Lost Boys, or if you are, or kind of know about it, um, the song he's referring to is pretty much the theme track to that movie, mm -hmm. and it was, yeah. uh, I believe, the one hit 
that that artist had done. I can't remember the. Wasn't that a, a specific individual? I don't think it was a band that did it. I think it was a specific guy's name that that recorded originally wrote recorded that song. I can't remember. Yeah, without looking it up, I can't remember. But a lot of other bands have covered that song. Yeah. Um, which the way I found out about it was uh, L.A. Guns, uh, which is oh. a, an 80s hair metal band. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, yeah. uh, I, my dad actually gave me the idea to uh, to present it to my band at the time. He's like, oh, you guys should cover that song. And I was like, you know what? That's a good idea. And uh, so the L.A. Guns version was the first one that I remember hearing. But I went back to the Lost Boys and realized that was the, actually the theme song of, right. of that. Movie. So I was like, even better, because it's a Halloween show. You know, it's, it's a vampire movie. So why not? <laughs> nice. So how, how long has it been since you guys moved down here? Uh, I don't know. I have COVID brain right now. Um, <laughs> three, four years. Four years, three, okay. four years, something, something like, that. like that. Yeah, yeah. it's the time is a weird, a weird thing. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. Yeah, because it's been about four years. We've been here since eight, 2018. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we moved here in at the very beginning of the year, 2018. So we just passed our four-year mark. And we've nice. known each other since 2013, so it's been a very creative ride. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, I know what you mean about time. It's like all the days and weeks and months are blending together lately. Yeah. <laughs> For about the last four years, it feels like. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> I, would, I don't even ask what day it is anymore. I just give up. You know? <laughs> yeah, there's all the I work, I work for it. I work remote, so I was pretty excited like 45 minutes ago when we got out of the house to go get Sonic, so <laughs> <laughs> that's where my mind's been. Well, things are starting to gear up here um, again with more shows. It's it's um, It's been like a kind of hit or miss thing, but I've seen a lot of stuff popping up now. Um, any chance we get to see you guys perform sometime soon? Very soon. Uh, we have something in the works. I can't really uh, disclose it at this okay. moment. Um, but I do recommend that you go check out her social networks, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Facebook and Instagram specifically. Uh, just like Lydia's Castle, um, just follow us on there. We'll, we will definitely let everybody know once we're ready to, uh, to announce that. But uh, in short, we have something that might be coming up. Um, but just keep your eyes peeled. Hell yeah. Okay, we, we definitely we have- will do. We have something coming up. Fuck yeah. Thank you. We do. We totally do. We'll be we'll be announcing it very, very soon. Awesome. So we like yes. to see us active, yeah. active bands yep. doing things. Yeah. It is it's very nice to see uh, artists making art. And um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys for making art. That's good. Yeah. Good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening to our art. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks for uh, coming to join uh, us down here in Music City, which Alice knows how I rant on about all the time that we like to keep music in Music City. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No more hotels, just music. Right. <laughs> oh my God. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. I, my uh, my biggest fear, and you know, we haven't been here for that long, so I guess we kind of contribute to the to the problem. But um, my biggest fear with this with Nashville is that eventually we're, people are going to run out of things to visit here to see. You know, there's so many hotels been eventually all the music venues will go away if we don't you know stand up and, and say something about it um especially with the predicament that exit in um was was in um you know it's a great thing that uh, a lot of musicians and just a lot of people in general including uh the mayor you know stood up and said this is this is a a, a landmark we, we can't get rid of this and i think that's an important step for um the community in general um that's an important step that everybody should take is to stand up for uh music venues and small businesses in general um Mm -hmm. you know that's that's the foundation of of what makes this country the way what it is um so i'm a very i'm a very big supporter of that and i think that that's something that should definitely um be more common for people to do is to you know stand up and say something you know, reserve or uh, preserve the heritage of uh, the good parts of Nashville, um, you know, right. music wise and, and, and just community wise in general. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. Well said. We, we often encourage Alice to speak up when she clears herself from the, the rabbit holes we lead her into. I don't uh, I don't get the opportunity that much anymore because I'm 
stuck on a satellite or wandering around in the rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm really glad to see more and more people coming into town and bringing that message. Well, and I think it's all about community too. You know, um, I had a friend the other day who had asked, you know, where, what city is going to have the next big or best music scene, you know? And I was really thinking about it. And, um, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it a hundred times again, but you know, the scene, the next big scene is where you want to make it. Mm. You know, it's about going to shows that aren't your shows. It's about listening to the local station when it's not your band that's going to be playing on it. You know, you can create the community that you want to see flourish. And um, I've always said that it doesn't matter if you're in the boonies of North Carolina, St. Louis, it doesn't matter where you're at. If you have talent, and you have something that people really like, kind of like my, my example is on like Black Friday, right? If you have an Xbox coming out, people will line up for that Xbox. Well, if you have a product people really like, they'll line up, you know, to see it. And I think if you create that community, create the music that people really enjoy, you know, that's, those are the, the focal points to creating the next big scene. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, yeah you, you can, <laughs> at any point, anyone can do anything they want to, but a lot of us have fear and hesitation about doing stuff. It's like, all you have to do is do it. Especially in today's age, uh, with technology, the way, it, the way it is now, uh, you can make a record in your bedroom, you know, uh, anytime you want to. At any point in, in the day, you don't have to reserve time for it. Yep. You don't have to... Uh, you don't have to pay anybody to do it. You could literally do it for free if you wanted to. Um, you know, it's it's interesting, but yeah, you should definitely do what you want to do. Um, and the only person that's holding you back is yourself. And sure. that's, you know, for sure. Well, and you know, fear, fear is a weird thing, right? Because I recently um, went skydiving and I was so scared to step out of the plane. <laughs> I mean, I literally was like, I have this really crazy feeling I'm going to die. <laughs> and it's funny because it's the, the most beautiful things in life are on the other side of fear. Mm -hmm. And then once you step out of that, that, um, that headspace, you're like, why did I let this hold me back for so long? Yeah. 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 Remember that, Alice. The most yes. beautiful things in life are on the other side of fear. And that's a Will Smith Sorry. quote that's not quoted by me. <laughs> Trademark. <laughs> Trademark. <It's a> good <laughs> one. <laughs> I, 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 I like that. As far as I, you, you echoed, echoed it through these halls first. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Will Smith's never come on the show and said that. Yeah, so well, he didn't say it. Okay. When he shows up well, on the show. Well, if he hears it. I'm a huge fan, but, yeah. <laughs> but no, like it's with music, you know, like we're so scared to like say things or like stand up for what's right. And you know, all those things, but you know, once you finally put yourself out there and you really chase it, it's just, there's, it, there's a lot of beauty and not being scared anymore. And I kind of think that for Lydia's castle, you know, for, for so long, you know, that's been like an uphill battle to get to where we are. But I think at some point as a musician, you just kind of snap and you're like, I'm just going to go for it. And whether we sink or swim, at least you can live life saying that you actually tried doing it, you know? Yep. We, I think we, uh, well, at least for me, and I think for most people, like we regret more of the things we didn't do than the things we did. It's like, the chances we didn't take. Absolutely. I can agree with that 100%. Yeah. It's like, if you mess, if you mess something up, it's like that, that doesn't hurt as much as not trying at all. Right. And, and missing out. Yeah. And, you know, we were saying when we were recording this record, we were, you know, this is the best music ever. You know, every band says that, right? <laughs> and uh, and we do. We hope that you know it would t take off and inspire people more importantly um, in their lives. But you know, at the end of the day, we just had a really great time recording it and writing it, and it was fun. And I think that like if you lose sight of just in that enjoyment and that fun, then you're just not doing it for the right reason. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. 
That's well, exactly right. And in saying that, you know, because that experience translated to you all as the musicians and the people that created that, then it was the greatest music out, you know, because as like right. we all say, you know, as much as, as much as a, a pop artist, and I say pop is not a genre, but a popular artist says they write for their fans, that's when things begin to fail because truly artists are only doing things for themselves. And who are we to assume what our fans want? Right. right. Mm. <laughs> that's Absolutely. excellent. Yeah. Man, that's, yeah. We know for the most part that they they don't, I've noticed through history, they don't respond to lying too well. And I was taught by a great songwriter that taught me that it doesn't matter what you say and how you put it in a song or the type of music it is, as long as what your message is and what you say is the truth, mm -hmm. and as long as it's ringing true to you, people hear that no matter how it's sung to them. They hear when you're when you're phoning it in or when you're got your heart in your sleeve, you know, yeah. you can tell that. I yeah. Think, uh, especially for me, I think that when I hear a song or when I'm I'm listening to even a storyteller or a poet or it doesn't matter who it is, just somebody telling me their side of 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 their story um that's what i look for i don't look for uh i don't want to hear that i'm right i don't want to hear that my thoughts right. that i'm you know and that goes with anything even whether whether it's a debate or or whatever it is i don't want to hear what i expect to hear what i want to hear is what you have to say and if i feel like that that's authentic whether i agree, agree with it or not um that's where the respect comes in um right. whether i you know, if we're talking about music, it, you know, maybe your, your style of music isn't what I listen to all the time, or maybe it's not necessarily my favorite uh, music that I, that I gravitate towards. But if I can respect it and I can, I can uh, sense um, that you're being honest, then uh, I'll listen to your music all day long, whether I like it or not. I, you know, if I, if I, if I can feel what you're saying, you know, then that's, that's all I care about. Right, like that emotion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Bob Dylan's not the greatest, you know, singer in the world, but he he writes about truth, and he that's all I care about. Uh, you know, his voice yeah. isn't <laughs> isn't the best, but uh, it's it sounds whoa, it sounds whoa. like I it sounds like a Bob bird. Dylan. I love Bob Dylan, but <laughs> he's <laughs> it sounds like a bird to me just just from what he says because I can tell it's honest, you know, mm -hmm. and it comes from it comes from a real place. And that's that's what I'm talking about. No dig yeah. at Bob. He's obviously I, one of the greatest. I'm on the same page with you there. Bob Dylan, not a great vocalist, excellent songwriter, though. <laughs> and he would tell you the same too. It's you yeah, that's no big, no big secret, but he's obviously <laughs> one of the greatest writers ever. So well, I mean, you well, know, Will Smith and now Bob Dylan joins the show. Bob Dylan, <laughs> I love you. Yeah, we love you guys. <laughs> yeah, Will Smith and Bob Dylan are both huge fans of this show, I know. So <laughs> well, well, dialing back to what you were talking about earlier with Hendrix being one of your uh, you know, big beginning you know spark offs mm -hmm. the one thing about jimmy when he worked with eddie kramer is um jimmy couldn't stand his own voice he thought he could he thought he had the worst voice in the world he wanted to bury it he yeah. wanted to bury and it. um when they um when they first went into olympia and the first studios he went into he had them hang curtains up in the vocal booth and when they built electric lady he had her curtains put into the vocal booth because he didn't want anybody looking at him when he sang. If you watch any live footage of him, he shuts his eyes every time he walks up to the microphone. Okay, he just yeah. did not like the way his voice sounded at all. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I I don't sing all the time. I do background vocals, or if I get up on stage with somebody out in, on Broadway or wherever, sometimes I'll get up and sing, but uh, I'm the same way. I, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of my voice, but um, I think Hendrix, uh, knew the importance of getting his message out whatever that meant and obviously and his one of his biggest influences was uh bob dylan mm -hmm. you know circling back around to the bob dylan i mean yeah. i think he i think if he it's one of those things like if, if he can do it then i can do it too type of deal um yeah hendrix is another another great example um i personally love his voice like his timbre and everything I won't say that he's the greatest vocalist of all time, but he right. is a great writer, obviously a great guitarist um, and a great visionary um, and a lot of yeah. different aspects, whether that's music or style um, mm -hmm. or just, you know, general ideas. Um, 
you know, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of uh, um, a whole lot of his uh, thoughts that float around because he was with us for such a short amount of time. So it's hard to hard to really tell what was going on up there. But based off of what I've seen, I think that uh, you can kind of get the gist that he was just all about love and just mm-hmm. peace. Well, the, the community and going back to what you are bringing up with the community of a music community at that time. And that's a perfect example between him and Dylan because, you know, if a lot of people don't know, a lot of people that just know of Hendrix, you know, know a handful of songs and one of them is all, all along the Watchtower. Everybody that knows Hendrix knows that, but, you know, a high percentage of them probably don't understand that that's a Bob Dylan song. Right. And when Jimmy did it, he did it differently. He did the style he did it. And Dylan heard that and liked it so much that he recut it on his following album that that version you know yep and that's the kind of respect and camaraderie that musicians had for each other and that some of them still do but you didn't have the same type of competition in the community mm-hmm. that you yeah. that you can run into now because it's so the scene is so accessible with social media and what have you. And it's like you're saying, you can, you know, you can technically record a record in your bedroom. Now, being mm-hmm. a producer, I would never suggest <laughs> that you think that that's going to be your best quality uh, work. You but, know, but people do it all the but time. But people do it all the time. And I can't argue with the success of some people that have pulled it off. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, um, results speak volumes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, I don't necessarily listen to her music, but uh, Billie Eilish, I think her and her brother, uh, they record the majority of, of their music, I believe, in their bedroom at their parents' house, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, wow. Now, they, they do a lot of stuff in the box. They don't necessarily like cut live drums or anything, not that, I, that, that I'm aware of, but, um, you know, it goes to show nowadays, like I said, with technology, you can kind of do anything at anywhere. Um, there's really no excuse besides your own limitations that you set on yourself. Yeah, right. for sure. Uh, but yeah, with the com- camaraderie, uh, you know, I believe community is key, whether it's a um, whether it's a music scene or whether it's just any sort of social issues in general. Um, you know, community definitely has to be there. Um, I don't know if necess- if it was better back then than it is now. I, I, I don't know. I'm not that old. I think old. it was just different because the access, you know, I mean, technology brings change. We talk about that all the time here, you know. I think that, that it, it brings social change and social evolution. So I think you got to you kind of got to take the good with the bad, was, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like like back in the day, it's like you don't have nearly as many tools available to you. Right. But you also got all this time on your hands because there's no video games or right. cell phones. Well, you also like, had bands that had to be ready to cut a song and talented to the extent of rehearsed because, mm. you know, you couldn't smack the space bar on, the, on it and record a thousand times over and over because there was no hard drives to keep wiping. You had tape. Yeah. And yeah. tape is insanely expensive now but back then it wasn't that it was so expensive but it, it's just time consuming yeah and you're well, paying an you're engineer paying and you're, you're paying, paying a couple engineer. engineers sometimes and if yeah. your band doesn't have it mm-hmm. now one guy i mean i can sit and make it sound you know i can sit in my in my basement and make it sound like i had a, you know an orchestra come sit in yeah you know mm-hmm. And then yeah. I think with like uh, with my generation, like, for example, I never t- had the discipline to learn an instrument growing up. And that's that's my generation is a lot of us were too busy playing video games and watching TV to to learn a craft, to learn a, a discipline. And um, <clears throat> so I think a lot of the musical artists coming out now, it is, you know, unfortunately, we do see a lot of people doing like easier stuff. And that's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But, you know, a lot of synth a lot of um, like rapping and hip hop vocals. And I, hip hop is my, primarily what I listen to. Um, so I'm, I'm knocking myself on this as well. And, uh, but it, it's like, it's not that that's easy, but it, there's a difference between doing that and picking up a instrument and learning a whole new language with this thing in your hands. 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I mean, yeah, and it, we, you know, that there's good and bad with that too, because now we have all these brilliant um, wordsmiths coming out that are just, you know, doing their own thing. Oh it's, yeah, I mean, right. you have you have people like Nas, you have people, yeah. uh, you know, you have a lot of a lot of really good words, wordsmiths out there. It's not that um, it's not that hip hop is bad. I you know, there's a lot of a lot of rap that I like, um, and a lot of hip hop that I you know I really enjoy. Um, I think it's it's a matter of what you're interested in. Um, you know, yeah. maybe you didn't pick up an instrument instrument because that's just didn't strike your interest, and that's okay. You know. Uh, playing an instrument is not everybody's cup of tea sometimes right. it's writing you can still write songs without knowing how to play an instrument at all <laughs> you know um you know it's it's all about what's in your head and and what your vision is right. uh, you know you're a writer so obviously you you you're artistic um and you uh, you have a vision um and that's half the battle i mean i can't tell you how many people that i've uh have run into over the years that you know play an instrument but have no vision and they just play whatever somebody writes for them or whatever they hear on the radio and that's that's fine as well but um if you're wanting to get total satisfaction in in my opinion and this is my opinion alone um writing is where it's at you know writing using your instrument whether yeah. that's your pen or whether that's your microphone um or whether that's your guitar your synthesizer whatever it may be um but going back to your point of too busy watching you know tv or video games and taking the easy the quote unquote easy way out yeah um you know anybody can pick up a guitar and make noise but whether that noise is good uh is is subjective and the easy way out i think that many people nowadays find it harder to pick up an instrument because it takes uh time away from your distractions around around you Yes. You have to take time away from your computer. You have to take time away from your phone, your tablet, your your TV. Um, and I think we were um, very uh, blessed in, in the in the fact that we um, we grew up in that era where those things were starting to become more prevalent, cell phones and things like that. But um, I think for the for the first you know maybe sixteen years of my life. Um, I didn't, I couldn't care less about a cell phone. I, yeah. I, my, I had one of those block phones, like with the, with the rubber buttons on it. And uh, <laughs> my dad would always tell me, keep that in your backpack and turn it on after school. And I would never turn it on. I never turned on my phone because I was like, what's the point of this? This is dumb. You know, when my space came out, I, you know, I, I couldn't care less about it. Um, you but, know, you know who doesn't run the marketing in our band? Yeah, and social media. <laughs> I don't. I uh, I'm not very good at it. You know, I I love being able to keep in touch with people, but um, I'm I'm a hermit sometimes. So I uh, hey, that I, shit can be a two edged sword, man. Like I'm kind of doing that dance myself, where it's like I use social media to promote what I'm doing and you know my own art, and but I, I have to take a break sometimes and like um, live life, you know. Yeah, I feel like if everybody was using it for the right intentions, I would like it more. Um, <laughs> right. But I, there's just so there's much. A, there's a love hate with it. There's good things that come out of it, like people being able to stay connected, but there are over connection. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, going back to Cody's point. So before I um, started like singing and writing lyrics, I like yourself um, did poetry, hmm. started writing poems so uh you know like just art art is just you know whatever you make of it social media is what you make of it there can be good things there can be bad things but yeah you know, it just depends on how you spend your time but luckily we grew up with like a lot of outside time my parents locked us outside with like a garden hose so nice. and that's like a real thing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's another thing too. I don't I don't see kids riding their bikes anymore. Mm. Um, you know, I as a kid I remember riding my bike yeah. everywhere. Um everywhere. I I yep. there was not a single place I didn't ride my bike. I would I would ride it all over St. Louis. Um and my my dad lived in Illinois. I'd ride it everywhere around there too. Um you know, it's I think a lot of people are more nervous nowadays with um sure i think social media kind of contributes to that if we're going to kind of wrap it all in the one 
one little tidy package here. But um, yeah, that's just one thing you don't see anymore. It's just kids outside, you know, getting away from their tablets and screens and stuff. Um, yeah, that's has, true. Has its own benefits too. Yeah, it's one of those things where, as a parent, you don't. Growing up, and especially growing up in the era I did, you don't want to shelter your kids and have them you know, weakened by not, by not having, you know, lack of exposure, but the shift in the way society and, you know, the, the way things aren't the same in the outside world as in just walking down the street now is a whole different thing. It was when I was 15 years old. Yeah. And when I was 15, people were saying, you know, and the 60s and the 70s when they were a teenager it was a different thing but much like technology it was an exponential jump mm -hmm. you know it wasn't you know it's like you got 50 years where everything kind of seemed to be the same and then there's this jump and then it was 20 years and then 10 and now it's like every five years it's a whole nother set of rules it doesn't just evolve it completely flips so you have this technology that you would think could help you be safer, but at the same time, you just end up worrying more about kids or people who are unable to, who don't have the wisdom to mm -hmm. put these things together quick enough to keep themselves safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, technology kind of uh, accelerates that, you know, how you were stating you know, it would take so long, a certain, you know, let's say 50 years for uh, a cultural shift to happen or whatever the case may be. Um, social media kind of makes us hyper aware of everything that's going on around the world. Um, and we didn't always have that type of access. You know, that's the same thing that happened with uh, the newspaper. And that's the same thing that happened with TV when the television first came out. Same thing that happened with radio. Um, and the more that we make those advances, the quicker that things change because we're hearing, oh, this person over here on the West Coast is doing is doing this. I heard it on or I saw it on on Facebook. Now we're going to do this. Oh, the next fad over here that I found on Instagram. Oh, we're going to do this now. Um, I, I definitely think that technology speeds that up a lot. And I think that um, humans aren't meant to be this connected. You know, I think we're more connected than we're, we're meant to be. Yeah. Um, it's great to have, you know, obviously it's great to have the technology that we have now to stay connected with people that we can't always see, you know, face to face, but um, it, obviously this is, it's very unnatural for us to be sitting, you know, and our monkey we, brains don't know how to compute it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is this? Yeah. I think why, why am I talking to other creatures, but they're not there. They're on this <laughs> yeah. surface, but uh, this makes me weirdly lonely, but yet also Alice, releases I dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I often uh, bring that up when I talk about, you know, our perceived um, beginnings as humans with the fire, you know, inside the cave, you know, the cave paintings on the walls. And that's, you know, you have somebody speaking and teaching everybody and laying out you know the first things written were hunting you mm -hmm. see people teaching you're teaching the young how to hunt yep. you know and then they bring it out and they practice it and as you know everybody sits around this flickering fire and then things advance a little bit and it becomes a podium mm. and then it advances it becomes you know a radio then it becomes a television then it becomes interactive television yeah it's like you know, and now we can carry that fire around Mm -hmm. The problem is, is we can't center a single fire around someone anymore. We all have our own and we're all looking at each other going, look at my fire. Look at my, <laughs> look at my flickering. But right. everybody's too busy looking at their own. That or we've, yeah. that or we've lost track of that fire because I remember like during COVID, um, you know, there were stores that didn't have chicken or didn't have hamburger or like certain things were sold out. And I remember telling Cody, I was like, this is just to kind of go down the rabbit hole, Alice. <laughs> uh, you know, like these are, 
we become so reliant on people to hunt our food for us, do these things for us, like instant gratification, like Amazon, et cetera, that if we really needed to actually like feed ourselves, we wouldn't know how, I don't know how to, I don't hunt. I wouldn't know where to go. I live in, you know, Nashville. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, you know, speaking of fire and carrying it around, it's almost as if like, you wonder if maybe we've lost sight of that fire, you know, those ways yeah. as well. Yeah. No, yeah. The self-sufficiency is like the most scary thing to, to our governments is like, they don't want us to, to be able to take care of ourselves. What, what do you mean you don't need us? Yeah, we, <laughs> they don't like that. Yeah. It's, it's um it's it's an interesting time to be alive. I'm not um I'm not in any kind of position to be thinking about this kind of stuff anyway, but something that I think about is like I would I would be so terrified to raise kids in this world cuz Oh, sure. cuz everything is just going to shit so quickly and it's like it's hard to find people that think things are getting better. Most of us agree that things are getting worse. They're getting Alice have lots of children are great for your anxiety. <laughs> That's what you I've know, heard. And I've said that too. I'm like, you know, bringing a child into the, today's world is so scary. And I had this conversation not too long ago with somebody else who piggybacked and said, well, that's a reason to bring children into the world, mm. to bring children into the world so that they can change it or lead by the example that you want to see, like, let them be the change that you want to see in the world, you know? So there is like those negative like because I think the same way like I would be terrified but then it's also a good opportunity to like allow them to lead by example I, that's an excellent point if if everyone stops having children out of fear then like we're all fucked for sure so <laughs> yeah well, hopefully Alice has yeah. some babies for all of us <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's it's funny the the um what you just said reminds me it's kind of like god sending down his son it's like you you need to like the the biblical narrative it's like right. you're you're going to go down here and save everyone you're going and it's like a it's like sacrifice the one for the many and like i i agree that that's a very noble thing to do i just i don't know if i'm ready to make to, to sacrifice my baby to the world you know <laughs> <laughs> that's a big decision you know yeah. and it's kind of like um you know it's kind of like um there's this th this is just a a short story for you but there's this story about um this guy who had a job and within his job he would like talk to people and um you know his his end goal was um he was a preacher. So he wanted to like see people, you know, um, you know, like get saved, et cetera. Right. So he got really, um, upset that nobody was doing that. He thought he wasn't doing good at his job, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, he ended up like passing away, but like at the end of it, he didn't realize that like what he was doing was part of a bigger story you know, like the things he was saying was part of a bigger story. And so like, I like to tell musicians what I just told you, because there oftentimes I hear like musicians say, you know, well, I just don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. I don't feel like I'm doing anything. I'm not seeing the results I want to see. And I feel like I'm spinning my tires and I'm wasting my time. And the funny thing is, is like, through our lyrics, through our music, through the people we talk to, like even you guys today, like somebody else will hear it, hear the music, and you never know like what kind of like seeds are being planted in other people's minds that maybe they need to hear what we have to say. Maybe those lyrics are like the one thing that like saves someone's life. And um, I don't remember what rabbit hole I was getting down, but you know, those, those little things like they can, they help people along the way even if you don't see the big results so if you have children it's okay too who knows like they they might it, with leading by their example like along the way help with some good things in the world yeah that's the idea yeah <laughs> positive <laughs> thing <laughs> teach your children but, well as that one band who 
used to be cool saying. <laughs> we won't get into that, Alice, though. Yeah. Uh, yes, have lots of babies. <laughs> or write a bunch of good music and just yeah. do it because you love it. And if it helps somebody, great. And if it doesn't, I mean, that sucks, but... <laughs> yeah i mean um no matter what you do in this life someone is going to have an issue with it but we just do the best we can and it's like um you no know, art like you're saying art is extremely important like i don't think any of us would be here without it right it's like that puts all the color in the world and it's like i don't it'd be everything would just be really bland without flavor you know mm -hmm. when i um started doing music so i graduated with like 50 kids like I was I like grew up in trailers in North Carolina like very very small town um and so like when with, I with 50 other kids in your class yeah you didn't have 50 kids when, by the time <laughs> just want to clarify that oh more. no 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 <laughs> there were no 50 babies coming out of this body <laughs> they just start walking out no, I'm just... <laughs> I had 50 children by the time I graduated <laughs> <laughs> oh look there's another one <laughs> no like I actually like 50 kids uh, I graduated with. and um so like when I wanted to do music and it was country at first I was like I'm gonna move to Indianapolis and I'm gonna get a record deal and I don't know why I chose Indianapolis like that was <laughs> I just thought like big city like those things happen and uh, and then so I ended up um, moving to uh, St. Louis and that's where like I met Cody and I was like, oh, wait, like there's actually like, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah, I, but I mean, you know, it sounds like you, you guys can relate to this too, but you know, when you when you really want something and you make efforts to do it, like the universe will catch you and it'll it'll help you do that. It'll help you along to, and it's not going to be easy, but it can get done. Like the universe wants us to, to fulfill our destinies, you know? Yeah. That's what I believe. No, I, I believe that for sure. I think that, um, I think we all have a spot. Yeah. We all, we all have a it, place. It, it would be counterproductive of the universe to not be that way. Oh, that's because a good point. we are the universe. Yeah. You know, as like constantly holding yourself back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, everything, everything is a puzzle piece and everything fits in some sort of way. Um, we might be a really obscure piece with a lot of weird jagged edges, uh, but we do have a place. Everybody has a place. For sure. Um, switching it up a bit uh, and you, you guys answer in whatever order you want to. Um, what do you think happens after we die? How would I know? <laughs> so I guess let me let me say preface I like to preface when I say that also nobody knows no one on this planet has any idea what the answer to that question is but I think we all have certain inclinations or ideas about it Alice was uh probably wondering when when Alec, yeah when Alex was gonna drop sorry to put you on the spot this is something I ask everybody though <laughs> oh no you're fine I mean I think that there's definitely like a place that you go after you die I don't know what that place looks like or you know like what it, it it would obviously like look or feel like um but i think that you know you see your loved ones again i think that you see the people that um you know you miss i don't ever think that it's the end i think that this is just the beginning honestly like just another chapter you know there's a beginning and the end of every book and i think that beyond this there's another book to be written so something, something happens after we die. Something, I think something. I don't think that there's, I don't believe that there's nothing. Hmm. And how about you, Cody? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, that's something that I contemplate pretty regularly. Um, Same. <laughs> you know, I, I think that it's healthy to, uh, to explore um different ideas as as far as what may happen and at the end of the day I, I don't really uh concern myself with it too much because it's it's going to be what it's going to be at right. the end of the day um man to answer your question directly um i've always grown up thinking that uh just like tanya i i you know there's 
uh, it's either a place or a feeling or, or, or some sort of release. I do, I do think that there's a release from this world. Um, I do believe that we, uh, we're energy. Um, everything is energy. Mm-hmm. And I, I do believe that that energy is released, um, from our bodies, uh, whether that stays on this earth or whether that, uh, just emits into the universe or whether that's completely baloney and nothing ever happens. I don't know. Um, but if, if nothing were to happen after we die, then why would we care? Cause there's nothing and we're, we're done, you know? Um, but for me, I, I like to think that, um, you know, my loved ones that I miss dearly, um, I like to think that I'd like to see that I can see them again. Um, I like to think that there's, uh, something or someone or some sort of energy that's that's watching over me um guiding me and helping me avoid pitfalls in life um i like to think that um but i i'm inconclusive i will say i'm not really entirely sure but i do believe that um, so something something i think something (laughs) i don't think i don't i don't necessarily think it's nothing but I'm not, I'm not sure. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's a really good idea to be open-minded on these kind of things because, you know, none of us know, you know, and I, I, I agree. I think it's probably something, but I also, you know, like you guys, I'm not putting all my eggs in that basket and it doesn't matter. Right. That's the best answer I've, I've ever had to this question. Uh, shout out to Sarah Rose from Sarah in the safe word out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. She, she had the best answer to this question. She said, it doesn't matter doesn't matter what happens after we die. That's true. You yeah. know, what matters is what we're doing today, you know? Yeah. My, uh, my sister like recently got married and somebody um, in my family came forward and, you know, gave a whole like speech or whatever. And he, he said something that really just like kind of resonated with me. And he said that, um, you know, one of the most, um, one of the things he's, he really appreciated the most was being able to be in our lives and like to see these different segments of just like us growing up in these really beautiful like parts. And, you know, there's like not good parts in life, right? But, um, you know, he's somebody who believes that when you pass, it's you just are maybe in these memories of all of these like beautiful segments mm. that are just like, in your memory and you know you're just reliving these good memories or just the memories that you have so I always thought that that was really interesting as well you know um I don't know just interesting to think about similar to the there's a final dream theory that because time doesn't have any place mentally in your subconscious some people believe that eternity your eternity is the that last second before your last breath and you're unconscious and your dream is eternal because there's mm-hmm. no time mm-hmm. within that and that's physically what it is is that people are experiencing is that that forever last moment of a dream I think the dream theory is like beautiful. I mean, it's a possibility of like, you know, if I could just pass away and like relive just the memories throughout my life or like, you know, those dreams or whatnot. I mean, some, some of the best moments I've ever had in my life are like in my memory, in my memory box, (laughs) you know? I think what I like about that idea so much, like what makes it appealing is that that is heaven or hell depending on how you lived your life it's like right. it's like if, if you're a piece of shit that's not a comforting thought no yeah, you got <laughs> nothing but, you know. probably want to yeah you probably want to live better and have better memories yeah. <laughs> yeah and i think you know um I, I was raised uh very religiously to say the least and i i um i had like that left a bad taste in my mouth you know uh, coming up as an angsty teenager um <laughs> But there, there is a lot of truth in, in the statement that what you do matters. Like, like um, uh, I, I guess as far as like good and bad, it's like, I, I don't know if it's like heaven or hell, but um, I do very strongly believe that what we do has consequence. Yeah, the energy you put out is the energy that you, get, you put back, whether it's like to people 
or, you know, like if you show, if you're good to people, you hope that they're good in return. But if you're bad to people, you know, that energy. It's also the, yeah. The karmic stain mm -hmm. you leave on your memory of you with those that you leave behind. Right. If you're a great person. You're remembered as a great person. That's why funerals, you know, are necessary on the level of eulogies, you know. People don't really want somebody to get up and be like, well, I'm going to tell you all the garbage and the trashy stuff this right. dude did all his life. I want y'all to remember him to be the piece of garbage <laughs> that he always, you know, <laughs> that if, if your consciousness does exist on some other realm, then obviously the energy you're receiving from this side, if it's all negative and the world just thinks you're garbage, I imagine your floating ethereal consciousness is going to be picking up on that. And that would probably some kind of version of hell, you know? Mm. Well, the most important thing I think in life is how you make other people feel. Mm. You know, people will always remember, you know, they won't always remember like what you say you know, or your lyrics, but they'll always remember like how something made them feel, mm. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> like even with your poetry, you know, like people remember like, hey, that was, that made me feel like that was really beautiful, you know? Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it said, but I do remember. But I remember. <laughs> I remember that, that it made me feel some sort of way. And yeah. It made, me, it made me question uh, what I'm doing or if I'm doing uh, the right thing or right. what's, what's right to me as a, as an individual. Mm -hmm. To, to bring it full circle back to something we were talking about earlier. Um, I, when it comes to making art of any kind, whether it's music or a painting, I think really you have, you have two tribes of people. Um, art, art is, I think by definition, something like, and something happened to someone and they're trying to, to share that, explain it. Um, and that can result in like, uh, gets really popular and, and starts uh, making money even. And um, for the, the people that do that, that's, that's really cool. Uh, I think then you have another, you have the commercial side of music. You have the commercial side of art where it's like, I'm going to make something with the intention of this uh, make it, make, selling a lot of copies or um, reaching a lot of people. That's the intention behind it. And I think you, you, good art, the stuff that really takes off, it's, it's, it's either because it's so genuine, like we've been talking about, or it's because it, it was, <laughs> it's some like pop, pop single that's very, been very, very crafted. Yes. Been tailored. And there, there is an art to that as well. There's right. Absolutely. An art like there's marketing to like making the song to like knowing exactly what's going to make people tick and like making it just hitting that niche. It's like, yeah. the, that's the word magic that makes the world go around. <laughs> I, I remember why I was telling you about graduating and moving to Indianapolis. Um, so like when I moved there, um, you know, like I had this like idea of like just getting a record deal and making it big. And like, that was my focus. And then when like that didn't happen, I just became really devastated and depressed as like a musician. And then as I um, switched over into rock and moved to St. Louis, um, you know, my mentality changed to like wanting to write music to just help people. And then, so if you're, if you're, if your heart is in the right place, you'll never fail. If you, if your heart is in it for like the greed, the money, the publicity, the fame, you know, those things like come and go, you know, those aren't forever things you'll fail. You'll become depressed, but if you're doing it and knowing that, like, for example, like Phoenix is written primarily to me about being bullied, you know, it's about somebody being bullied and rising from that and I think we've all been bullied once or twice in our lives and we still see bullying today and standing up for what's right and so when you write music or you write art or you know you're an artist painter poet and you're doing it out of love you know it changes the game because you're never going to fail when you do it out of love you know that's yeah it's it, it's it comes back to the honesty thing you know write what you know that's um 
my, one of my, my greatest inspirations is George R. R. Martin, the mind behind um, the Game of Thrones series. And okay. um, he, he's, he's a phenomenal author. And one of the things, he, he does a lot of um, like, uh, like lectures for young artists. And I like listening to that. And um, one, of, one of the first things he tells young aspiring artists or uh, writers is write what you know. And because, you know, he's like, he, he said that was something that his writing coach had taught him when he was a kid. But when he was taught that, he didn't appreciate it because he's like, well, I don't want to write what I know. I want to write about spaceships. I want to write about <laughs> aliens. And then he's like, but once I got older, I realized that you can still write about aliens. Uh, what, what it actually means is like, he, for example, he, he said like that he has a lot of heartbreak throughout his life. He knows what it's like to have his heart stepped on. And he's like, so when he's writing, it's like those are the moments that like really catch with people is heartache and loss uh because it's something that's coming from his heart you know yeah and it's something we can all relate to you know yeah we've all yeah. have lost somebody or you know um seen somebody lose somebody um i think when you like push art you know like people who say i, I want to write in this direction well having a goal direction is good to write in but letting it flow naturally, letting like the lyrics flow naturally, whatever it is, like without pushing it, you know, um, you know, like you said, people want things that are not made up, like real, tangible, you know, um, art. That yeah. Really and what, what you said about like letting it come through you, that that uh, brings me to another thing I'd like to talk about with you guys. Um, where I go back and forth on this, and I'm just interested to get lots of opinions on it. Where do you think art comes from? Because like you said, like sometimes you can just like almost channel it, right? It's like um, you sit down without intention and just let yourself go. And it's like, where, where does that really come from? Do you think it originates with us or are we kind of like conduit for it? I don't know, man. Like I can sit here right now and like, we do this all the time. We have like, a, if we're on and on a road trip, we'll turn the music off and see like how many melodies we can come up with and just press record on our phone and just let it roll. And I have no idea. Personally, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I have a theory on that. Um, I think art is a language. And I think that we use art in place of words, just depending on what your art form is. Um, I think that whether it be uh, if you want to write a haiku or whether you want to write a song or whether you uh, just want to bang on the drums really loud, I think that we all have our own way of- um, Like express expression? Ex yeah, expressing uh, how we feel or what we're thinking. I know for me uh, that rings true because I'm not, uh, I, my, my mom is a, is a very, very, very good writer. Um, and I am not, <laughs> I, you know, but the, the way that I, um, interpret how I feel or what I'm thinking is through sound. Um, if I'm angry, then I, I write an aggressive rock song. If I'm moody, then I write something very ambient. Uh, if I'm feeling funky, then I'll, I'll put down a really good groove, um, you know, or I'll, I'll think of something like that. Um, I think that's just your language. I think that's where it comes from. Uh, All right. So piss you off, write more metal. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, there was a James Hetfield. I, I read somewhere that he, he writes, he writes his riffs when he's happy and in a good mood and he writes his lyrics when he's sad and um that's interesting so i i like to think that that's just his that's that's just his way of conveying his emotions um so yeah in, in short i think art comes from uh your need to express how you feel or what you're thinking yeah that makes a lot of sense that's just the way it comes out that was way better than my answer. <laughs> <laughs> my answer was nowhere. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. Cool. I got another odd one for you guys. Um, okay. Any 
ghost stories or experiences you would consider supernatural? I have a few. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's hear your stories. <laughs> I have a couple. Um, I'll start. I'll start with the short one, and then I'll get into the a little bit of a longer one. Um, short one. I remember. <clears throat> yeah, man. I don't remember what what movie this was, and I I I swear that I think I. I don't think I'm just imagining this movie happening to me, but it was like a, it was an exorcist moment. I don't think it was the actual exorcist. It was like the exorcism of Emily Rose was or whatever it was. No, it's not a dream. Um, what happened was I was, I woke up in the middle of the night and for the longest time I was waking up at like three in the morning and three in the morning, I guess is like kind of like the witching hour. <laughs> exorcist time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember waking up and there there was just this weight on my chest like I couldn't move mm. and I uh, felt like something was sitting on me and no. it was one of those moments where like I was staring up at the ceiling I like I couldn't move my body it felt like something was sitting on me and it was it was for a moment I woke up it was for like one two three and then it was gone and I've never had that again since but I, <laughs> I how don't, old were you oh I was a teenager it was this was years and years ago um but I had that experience and then I have another experience uh and this is a little bit of a longer one I have to kind of give you a backstory on on why I think this actually happened but I was house sitting for my cousin and uh I was there watching their dogs and they had uh a, you know a kid or two at the time and I remember sitting at this house and when they bought this house they found out that someone had uh hung themselves in the basement and um they did not tell me anything about um i don't think i even knew this at the time i don't think i knew that the that any of that had happened and i remember there was one night it was really late and i was probably i think i was 16 at the time i could drive and i was walking back to uh their room and i you have to walk past their kids room and I remember walking past and there were some toys that were sitting in the in the doorway and there was this one toy I don't remember what it was but it made sound Stop. and it could it could move <laughs> and I remember walking past and I walked past went to the bedroom I came back out and I have to pass that room to go to the kitchen and I remember there being a toy there that I don't remember seeing there and I thought it was kind of weird and it was of course really dark and, and whatever. So I, I went to the kitchen, not thinking anything about it. And I came back and the toy was still there, still there. And I kind of stopped and looked at it and it started making noise. And <laughs> I don't know what it was, Dude, um, gone. <laughs> but I, I booked it to the room and I locked, I locked the bedroom door. I didn't come out. And then later I found out that someone had hung themselves in the basement of that house years ago. And- um, Whose house is this? Uh, I'll tell you later. Okay. But um, <laughs> yeah, that that happened, and uh, I I I believe to this day that that was some sort of supernatural something was happening there. Um, I definitely think that obviously the person was in distress when they when they decided to end it, and I I do believe that um, if your soul is not at rest when you uh, whenever you exit from this realm. I do believe that there's a certain energy and negative energy that that uh, um, hangs around hangs around that just that has no way of resting mm -hmm. uh, like a restless soul, I guess, is, is the way you could call it. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that was that was a very uh, that was a very weird, weird. If, moment they're, there. if they're able to uh, interact with this world. That's what they classify as a poltergeist. Mm -hmm. Poltergeist. Yeah. That's okay. I think um, that's specifically in a physical sense. Yeah, right? if they can yeah. physically, if, if whatever it is can physically affect things, move things around, that's mm -hmm. that's what a, the definition of a poltergeist. That's is. what would be different from like a just saying an apparition yeah. or a spirit or I saw, you know. Yeah, and later when I told them that, they were like, "Oh yeah, yeah, there, there's we believe the house is haunted. Like the TV turns on randomly. Like sometimes the light will be on when we didn't turn it on. I'm like, why didn't you guys tell me this before? I agreed <laughs> to, to sleep at your house, and I never yeah, did it. for real. <laughs> I never did it again. Um, I must have not been at that house then. 
No, it was before I knew you. <laughs> um, yeah, that's nuts, man. Um, yeah, crazy shit. I, uh, I definitely, I'm a believer as well. I, I think, uh, well, I, I know that that shit's real as much as you can know anything in this life. It's like through through personal experience. I don't want to. That's a whole rabbit hole to go down. But, um, <laughs> But it's always interesting for me to hear from people because I never experienced anything until I went looking for it. Um, I specifically like was looking for that kind of thing um, and previously was an atheist. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's always neat to me whenever I whenever I hear stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I've never had any kind of like spiritual interaction of course then again like i purposely don't look for it um mm. not that i don't think it's real i very much know so that it's real <laughs> i just think that i would be like really scared i watch like scary movies with like a pillow on my chest fingers next to my ears ready to like <laughs> like i'm a baby with scary stuff but i mean i recently like got into doing like tarot card readings for people and um that got like really really real and i was like okay we're gonna like not do this every day for somebody because it just takes a lot of energy out of you yes and yes. um it just got re like i was learning a lot about people that maybe i didn't want to like learn about people too and it just got really real like it was very accurate and uh so i was like okay we're gonna like do this like maybe like once a month <laughs> not like every single day but i've never had like cody or you guys like i've never had like um any like actual like real interaction like that but um not that i don't think it's real i definitely do i just i feel like i would get really scared i you know um and I, I try not to overstate myself when I talk about these kind of things, because it's like like the afterlife. None of us know what the hell is going on with this shit. Um, I have I have interacted with spirits, um, but I like to keep something like I, in in the back of my head. I just like grain of salt that maybe I'm just having some kind of like schizophrenic break whenever stuff like that happens. Sure. Um, even though I, I'm like 100 or 99 percent sure that's not what's happening. I always keep that with me because I think that's that's where like sanity and madness is kind of very tenuous yeah. uh, with that kind of shit and um now I, th I think that that the the cautionary approach is uh a lot wiser than the uncautionary approach with this kind of shit I think um there is cause for concern when you reach out and open that door because I mean you it could it could be fine you could get a hold of something that um just learn something, have an interesting conversation with, you know, but I think um, if you let a stranger into your house, it's kind of like that could go one of two ways, right? You know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you, uh, have you guys ever seen that new, um, do you guys watch Netflix? Yeah. Uh, that new show, uh, what is it, like Area 81 or something? Archive 81. Archive 81. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that yes okay so i actually i have a about that i have a pet peeve when it comes to exorcism movies and spirits because they never get it right and it's frustrating sure. um but archive 81 man the concepts they touch on in that show and the way stuff happens in that show gave me chills because it is it's super chill spot like on. When that girl was doing the reading and then she started like scratching at her, I was just like, <laughs> you have to watch cartoons like after this, like <laughs> I'm not sleeping. <laughs> I knew it was going to be good when they, when she finds them in the basement and they're all hyperventilating, looking at that statue. I was like oh, this spoiler alert, spoiler Alice. alert, Alice. All right, so if you haven't <laughs> seen it now, you know, <laughs> we told her just enough that she'll go watch it now. Yeah. Now Dude, I'm going to go like, watch this it, like in a day. Yeah, same. <laughs> it's real. It's real good. So speaking of spirits and like other worlds and yeah, who that it's, it's hard to find one that like does it right. Like for me, the uh, the Shining is is always my my go to for that. I've is, never seen the Shining. Oh man, that's. I mean, if you if if that kind of stuff scares you, that is like the penultimate. Still um, to this day, like I'm I'm somebody that like standard horror movies. 
you know, and slasher flick stuff like that don't really interest me. And I never really get scared by, you know, the the Friday the 13th style stuff. Like Saw. Something yeah, like you know, Saw, Saw, it wasn't so scary. The first one was just very interesting. And then they just, you know, let's see how much we can rehash this. But The Shining, <clears throat> Kubrick's camera work in general will... I mean, it'll have you climbing the freaking walls. Yeah, it's you know, have you seen it? I know everything that happens in that in that film, and how many people, you know, are something actually happens to, and it really amazes you when you look at it in retrospect after the fact. I don't really want to spoil it for you, but that it's that intensely frightening of a movie, of a film, when that it compared to. Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street, anything like that, it's really tame. Yeah. But at the same time, it blows them all out the water with just how... Atmosphere, man. Yeah, the atmosphere yeah. is just... I like, uh, I like when a movie gets into my psyche mm-hmm. and just, just twists it around and, and, and it just creeps me out. Whether it's the way that the camera work is done or, uh, or just the, the, the entire concept in general. Um, Man, I, I I don't do the slasher thing. I mean, it it, yeah. it more just kind of grosses me out than anything. I don't think it really really scares me. Oh, like yeah. blood and kind of thing. Yeah, like saw, like that type of stuff. Yeah, like, but you like war movies where people's legs get blown off. Well, that's not the reason why I like watching it. But <laughs> when it gets uh, to effects, you know, a lot of the slasher films, the effects are so lame compared to yeah. something like a high end war movie that oh, you're yeah. like, oh my god, that looks so real. I might have to <laughs> not eat lunch now. Saving oh. Private Ryan is like oh, his, man. Oh, man, that's my favorite movie ever. I was <laughs> I was fortunate enough to see that in the theater at a midnight showing when it came out. That's one of those movies that I've probably seen at least maybe 20 times. And nobody had ever done anything on the big screen with that kind of intensity. Well, just that I scene was. of them, you know, storming the beach and like it's just one continuous shot. And ah, uh, it's just uh, we're probably just... going to now hang up and just go watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> Thanks, that's guys. Not, that's not a bad idea. I think I might do the same thing. <laughs> Such a good movie. I will watch The Shining, and the next time that we jump on your podcast, like we fuck, can have a conversation. Fuck yeah, we have to do a, a post Shining recap episode. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's one of my favorites. I can go on for quite some time about the tidbits on that film. Yeah. Well, don't yeah, spoil no. it. I will watch it. And get through it as long as I can watch like some SpongeBob SquarePants like afterwards. That's a good idea. You probably have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind that it is one of those movies that has a book, but it's not one of those movies that it's even bothering. Mm. I mean, don't bother going to get the Stephen King Shining book because it's not getting, okay. you're not going to compare it to the movie. Yeah. Any, anything that Stanley Kubrick does if it's based on a book that whole book better than the movie kind of thing is yep that's out the window it's like one of the few one of the few movies where i i actually think the movie's better than the book he truly knows how to base it off of a you know it's not a movie version of this book i'm basing this movie off of this story and sometimes when i watch it i think about what it would have been like to see that movie when it came out like having already read the book right because it's like that is almost fanfare for people who have read the book right. but almost because it's not uh to the t exactly what happens because then when something that you're expecting to happen ha- doesn't happen right you're like oh shit the book is so intimidating like all of his books right because they're like this thing yes but, yeah and i'm just like there's no pictures <laughs> yeah i'm i'm actually not a big uh stephen king uh, yeah, fan I'm, as I'll much as real, i love the yeah, shining i'll be real with you you can probably take his in my opinion his whole catalog of what he's written and sum it down into like five different books yeah and you pretty much read everything he wrote you know um <laughs> because a lot of it does come across <laughs> as rehashings of the same thing mm. just in different a different, all way. different set yeah yeah on a completely uh, different note, sorry, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that I remember, like, as a kid, 
a specific like Stephen King book always being in our bathroom. So, and I was just like, when is my dad going to ever like get finished <laughs> with this book? <laughs> was, it, was it the stand? <laughs> I don't know, man. It was like, it was just like, the stand I swear is for like five years huge. the same book would be in there and i'm like are you still reading this book like <laughs> the stand is not a doorstop it is a garage doorstop <laughs> i uh i remember oh, man i remember open. my dad and my stepmom what i would i would there was one t there's like this one weekend i think we were just over there over at um at somebody's house and they were down in the basement watching the stand and it was like split up in like four different. I think at the time it was VHS tapes. It was like and a split so, up. Yeah, because well, it was a, it like, was actually a TV movie miniseries. It was. Was it was that what it was? Yep. That's just, why. I felt like it was dragging on and uh -huh. on and on. I was like, wow, this is the longest. And, and honestly, for at that era, you know, that's the same thing happened with it, and everybody rants and raves about it. And the best thing about it was, you know, Tim Curry. Yeah, but that was a made for television episode, just the same way as a stand. So, you know, coming up, I saw that as a really a cop out because I'm like, I don't want to see this on primetime channel five. This is, mm -hmm. I want to see this like on HBO. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to see blood and graphic and, yeah. you know, what the stuff's supposed to be. But they actually, you know, years down the line, I watched it on a DVD. So I could watch it all the way through. And they did not, not really didn't do a horrible job with the stand, you know. I haven't seen the stand either. I haven't either. <laughs> it's, you know. I, feel, I feel like we just need like a Stephen King like episode. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a Stephen King episode next time you guys come back. Okay. <laughs> You've seen uh, Salem's Lot? No, I haven't. I haven't seen that that's, a, that's a classic. That's a classic. Mm -hmm. Um. That's a better, like, straight out just horror movie of his, you know, that, uh, you know, a, a book of his that became. I saw a documentary on Stephen King and it was like, he's a really weird guy. Yes. He's, <laughs> he's, and like where he grew up is very creepy and like very weird. Like, it's just real chilling. Mm. Yeah. He had a lot of problems apparently early yeah. on yeah. in his career. He actually, I heard, I heard somewhere that he used to, uh, he would write his his books, completely whacked out on his, uh, on heroin or something, just completely. Blitzed. I think, I think, if I remember correctly, it was alcohol and coke. Oh yeah, that was that was what it was. I think and it was. He, was he, he he would like he, he would drank a whole lot and he did cocaine. There he would wake up the next morning not really knowing what he wrote. Right. Like, oh wow, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't remember like writing a lot of what he's written. I mean, yeah. like, to come up with that kind of stuff, like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, you, <laughs> it's like, you, what, what were you? Like, you have to, <laughs> you have to get into a certain mindset or just, you know, a certain state of mind to be able to, uh, to think in those terms. Oh, and, for sure, man. Well, typewriter, for you sure. know, and if you get used to doing typing, which I don't have a whole lot of typewriter background, I'm not that old, but. I did a lot of typing on word processing programs coming up, you know, because that's what we had to do. So I, and that becomes an instrument of its own. So writers, you know, um, they tend to, you know, you could see like a mindset, like Keith Richards said that, you know, a lot of his riffs, obviously he was hammered when he came up with. And in particular, he said satisfaction, one of their biggest hits he literally woke up the next day and he had his little recorder that he had and he hit it and was listening back and he just heard himself on there saying singing i can't get satisfaction in playing the main riff and sat and figured out what he did and brought it to mick and they wrote it up but he had no recollection of writing it he was just hammered playing and hit record and you know and it it's that kind of thing you know when somebody does it that often both the practice and the substance it just you know it it's kind of one of those things people feel like i used to often talk about i joke with my old, one of my old bass players about how you know bands when they stop doing drugs just their albums just weren't the same you know you're like wait a minute 
but and it's so horrible to say because they're like, hey, we sobered up, everybody's cool, nobody's gonna die. <laughs> and then they put an album out, and everybody's like, This is man, the this is garbage, worst, cheesiest <laughs> thing y'all ever done. Yeah, you know. But we're gonna need you to sacrifice your body. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I'm gonna need you to get back on smack and uh start just tearing yourself up across country because I need to hear yeah. my rock. It's kind of like uh with actors or actresses when they lose a bunch of weight when everyone's like used to seeing them overweight and they're right. like, You're not as funny as you used to be. You were funnier <laughs> when you were fat. And I was like, Yeah, that's that's a completely ludicrous thing to say. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You want to you want to be like, hey, you know, I'm glad that you got your life together. But at the same time, it's like, but I'm missing everything that you've offered me before. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost I'm like, like you know, well, if you sobered up, I mean, that's great. But you're not the same rock and roller that I loved before. <laughs> you, you're not the same person because. Can you go back sober. to fucking up your life, please? You know. <laughs> All right. Can you sacrifice your body so that I can have entertainment? Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, and I mean, that kind of goes to the, you know, back to the shut up and entertain us attitude. And I think as a as a fan of any artist that's going going through it, you know, and, and every artist is they're going through something like that. And it's like, um, you know, I, I think as as an observer, as a fan to avoid what we're talking about, you just kind of got to be like, OK, well, even though that new album sucks, it didn't ruin the old albums. The old albums are still good. I can still go back and read this Stephen King novel back when he was on a bender for eight months. <laughs> you know? Well, you're also going to find people that like the sober stuff more than the mm. drugged up stuff. So, I mean, it's kind of, you know, everybody has something that they like. And just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's terrible. It just means it's not your style. That is true. <laughs> yeah, true. It's all subjective with this stuff, for sure. Artists, artists, 100% subjective. I mean, it, it's it's just whatever you make it out to be. If you like it, then you like it. You know, Tanya might not like it. I like it. You know, it doesn't matter. It's just to each their own, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Like like flavors of ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. I have ice I cream so right many here. Buckets. Yeah. <laughs> Alice, we do not endorse. Um, Sonic. soft serve um, corporate ice cream products. <laughs> it, you got to get it from like uh, Mike's ice strictly cream strictly because they don't endorse us. Yeah. Hey, listen, this was like the excitement of getting out of my apartment. Hey, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I yes, Oreo ice cream, let's yeah. go. Sonic, sponsor us. I was forced to go make my my own. Yeah. <laughs> to make I, your own ice cream. I was imagining you with like make like making butter. It's like trading butter. Do oh no, no, making my own uh, milkshake. That's what oh, I was nice. drinking on. Because <laughs> they don't let me leave the satellite often. Yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> it, yeah we're actually up here in the stars right now, orbiting the planet. So, is that our next question? Aliens. Oh well, it is now. <laughs> Unidentified flying. We would not presume them to be alien <laughs> beings. We call that un unidentified flying phenomena now. Oh yeah. Oh man, that's that's have a whole you ever world. witnessed anything that you would consider to be unidentified aerial phenomena? Cody has Cody has in Arizona. Oh rock yeah. and roll. No, we're like so I have seen like probably every alien documentary on Netflix and Hulu and like HBO Max, mm. like <laughs> everywhere <laughs> you know the alien question is a weird one at this point because it's like who the fuck doesn't believe in aliens you would be crazy to think that like we're the only thing on this planet yeah like, well like obviously on this planet <laughs> <laughs> and in the world of in the world of planets in the, world of, in the universe <laughs> yes that's what i meant yeah. to say World of Planets is a good band name. There. World of World planets. of Planets. It's gonna be our EP name. Hell you yes. <laughs> you know, I kind of like to think of the universe as. Uh, <clears throat> have you ever seen Men in Black? Yeah. So I don't remember which movie it is, but at the very, very tail end of one of those movies, it zooms out, you know, into the universe, and then the universe is like it zooms outside of the universe. And it's it, it oh, enca it encapsulates the universe as a marble and like an alien is playing marbles with our universe type of deal. I don't know. Go watch. I think it's men in black, but I like to think of it that way, hmm. that we're just we're just something 
that's way smaller than something else, kind of like a, a germ. We can't see a germ. Like the idea that if you look at an atom, it does the same thing as a solar system, which is, does the same thing as the universe, which mm, exactly. is constant vibration, which is all energy is. So we it just depends just on be, how far you zoom in. Yeah, we could, all of our universe could be an actual atom in another and universe. That's, that's yeah. what the alchemists of Port, old were telling us. Port, when, here's a who. Yeah. The, yeah. the Egyptians had that figured out, like with, as above, so below. What, what you can observe on a, on a small scale happens on a large scale. And I think quantum physics recently has made that kind of weird where they're figuring out it's not exactly like that. But it is, it is, there's a lot of truth to it still, where it's like, if stuff that happens on the microcosm, that's, you can observe it on the macrocosm. Quantum I don't know. I just hope we're, another I just hope we're hole. Like What's that? I said quantum physics is a whole nother rabbit hole. Yeah, and I'm not going to pretend I, I actually, can talk on that at all. Quantum <laughs> physics, Alice, is the perception of multiple rabbit holes or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> so it could be down a rabbit hole or it could be down two. Yeah. Who knows? Or no rabbit hole. Sure. If or no rabbit hole. Rabbit hole. <laughs> Schrodinger's hole. Schrodinger's rabbit hole. <laughs> there is no hole. <laughs> Are we really down here? <laughs> I don't know. We we out here. Ooh. We, we oh, out my. here, y'all. <laughs> who are you <laughs> right <laughs> that's perfect timing and, <clears throat> and on that note alice phoenix is streaming everywhere go check out lydia's castle go like and subscribe to all their channels and their things and keep up with what they're doing uh and just before it plays when you listen to it make sure it's on the biggest speakers you own and turn the volume really loud play it over the loudspeaker at work wherever you are regardless yeah. of circumstance yeah just make no, don't only listen to it make everybody else listen they're to not, it they're not gonna fire you grab their phones <laughs> yeah. before you do that make sure you submit your resume to uh to other places as well because yeah go that's probably a good idea yeah but they're not gonna <laughs> fire you yeah no the song's so good they're like you know what you deserve a promotion turn that shit up turn it yeah. up <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you guys have an album coming out soon too, right? We do, probably. Is there a, uh, is there a release on that? Or we just keep posted on, on the socials? We're going to probably announce the release for it um, when we announce the show. So the okay. show will be our EP release show. Yeah, but we're okay, looking at yeah. like spring, you know. We're gonna try. We're gonna like trickle out some goodies, some music videos, and some you know some more singles until then. But yeah, it's coming. Nice. We'll definitely put all the uh, yep links down. Yep. Yeah, Alice, you don't have to go far. You know right down here is where you can find all that jazz. So, <laughs> well, it was nice talking to you guys. Um, hope you have a great rest of your night. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. We really appreciate it. Oh, been awesome. Always, always welcome here. Thank you. All right, Alice. It was good to see you. We'll see you next time. Good night. Right, bye, Alice. Alice. Bye. bye.